Hi, this is Jessica with Gold Rush Expeditions, and I'm very excited today to show you the Columbine Mining Complex and the Red Buck Gold Mine Claim. The Red Buck Gold Vein was actually discovered in the early 1900s, about 1903, by a gentleman by the name of Robert. He sunk a shaft 70 feet deep and hit very rich gold. He abandoned the claim and nobody knows why. In the early 1930s, another company by the name of Columbine purchased the claim, which is why you get the name of the Columbine Complex. There is a nice interpretive sign here that gives us a little bit of a heads up, a fresh start as to what was here. This is usually what Gold Rush does. We go around and we interpret old sites and see what the buildings were and what they were used for and why they were here. The buildings here, they were all used in support of the mining operations, obviously, and everything was being done on site. All the milling, they had a sawmill where they cut down all of these trees for the buildings. They recycled a lot of products from old mines. We have vats from old mines, boilers from old railroads, and shaker tables from old mines. I'm going to go ahead and take you on a tour of this site so we can show you all the amazing buildings and the history that is here at the Columbine Complex. We're still at the Columbine Mining Complex and I'm standing at what used to be used as a storage shed up until the 1960s. There's still a bunch of stuff in this shed. You could probably rummage through it. This storage unit and the cabins are actually in pretty good repair. This is because the mining claimants took the time to keep these nice, keep them standing, keep them in good repair. And the cabins across the way that we're gonna go see next are actually, been they've been added on to. The original buildings were not as big as they are now. If you look at these buildings and you look at what's been kept and what's been restored, most of this work is 1970s-ish. In 1976, there was a law passed that's known as FLMPA, FLMPA. And that basically gave the Forest Service the right to start kicking people off their claims. Once the Forest Service started kicking people off their claims, things started happening like this. People weren't up here, they weren't maintaining things, so everything started to deteriorate. So if you hear of this FLIPMA, you hear whatever, it's a bad thing. This is People should have the right to live on their mining claims and to work on them, and that's what makes them rich in history and beautiful and leave something behind that is, you know, something for future generations to look at. Whereas right now, our future generations are gonna have nothing to look at and they're gonna hike into everything because it's a wilderness. We've now moved a little further down the Columbine complex to what used to be the blacksmith shop. As you can see, it's in a little bit ill repair and it has not been maintained like the cabins we previously saw. The blacksmith was in charge of building anything metal. The nails used to build every single building and cabin around here. The railroad spikes that held the railroad track that had ore cars on top of it. The blacksmith was responsible for that. You had piping all along here that carried water made of metal. What if that busted? Who are you gonna call? Probably the blacksmith. This is something you don't get to see every day. This is a very, very old way and cheap way of pulling ore cars up and out of a mine shaft. This is what is referred to as a horse whim. You would have cabling around this portion here and you would have a big piece of wood here. This piece of wood would be connected to a horse and the horse would walk in a big circle. And as the horse walked around the circle, it would actually take the cabling and turn it. So if you wanted to go up the shaft, then the cabling would turn one way. If you wanted to go down the shaft, the horse would walk the opposite direction and it would go the other way. Again, this is a horse whim. More specifically, it's a Reynolds whim. It's stamped on the front and it's a Vulcan Ironworks out of Denver, Colorado. Also stamped on here. Love to see stuff stamped because it tells you exactly where it came from. Now, the shaft from which this horse whim was working is right behind us and we're gonna go take a look. This shaft is covered, you don't see this every day. We're at 10,400 feet in Colorado. They get tons and tons of snow up here, probably 20, 30 feet. Could you imagine trying to work a shaft in the winter covered in snow? It's probably not gonna happen. We just came from the horse whim and we learned two more things about this mine shaft and how it was worked. We have a two pulley system here. We have the cabling that we talked about goes from the whim through this sheave wheel right here. Now it would have gone underneath this sheave wheel and then up to this sheave wheel. And what that's doing is that's actually decreasing the weight load of the ore. When you change directions on a pulley system, it decreases your weight by half. So they were making this a lot easier on the horse by switching directions of your pulley, the horse didn't have to work as hard, making 
the horse able to work longer hours and longer days and go through less horses because eventually they will tire out. We also have at the shaft two compartments, a manway, which is where the workers, the miners, would have accessed the mine shaft from. There's a ladder going down in this first one. And then you've got the second one. This would have been where the ore was coming up and down. You would have had your ore bin coming up and going down, all being pulled by your horse from your whim. The other fun thing about this is you can see this old door that's open right now. This would have been open and closed as the mine was being worked or not worked. There is an old rope hanging from one of the supports inside of this mine shaft. It's not the newest of ropes, but it's also not the oldest of ropes. It was probably used at one point in time for somebody to shimmy their way down into the shaft and see what's down there. I'm standing here in what used to be the entrance to the adit at the Columbine complex. Behind me is the door where the adit used to go in, but it's since collapsed over time due to elements, weather, 30, 40 feet of snow that they get up here. So you can reopen this added in one of two ways. One, you and your buddies could come out with a few shovels and just start digging. Hopefully you, it doesn't take too much manpower. However, we are dealing with the elements around here. This area is not available to mine year round. You're mostly gonna be here in the summer. So to make things a little bit quicker, file a notice of operations, notice of intent, get in here with the backhoe, dig it open. That'll be a lot quicker than having a bunch of guys hanging around with a few shovels and beers. We're right outside the assay office right now where the assay stove or oven used to be, as evidenced by the slag left on the inside here. The assayer was responsible for, one, determining what minerals were of value inside the mines. He would have core samples come out of the mine. He would crush those up, determine how much percentage of gold, silver, copper was inside that particular area and say, yes, this is high, you should continue on this direction, or no, this is a bust, continue on another direction. So the assayer's other big job besides determining what metals were inside the core samples was to make the gold bars for the mine. So he would heat the metal up, he would pour them into the bars, and then he would certify those as being 0.999 pure silver, 0.999 pure gold. Looking here, I already mentioned that this would have been the assay oven, and you can tell by the slag, which this is the junk metal. This is the stuff that isn't worth anything that just gets left behind. Part of this oven, it looks like it was made from a company that was possibly called the Morgan Crucible Company. It just, the most I can make out is the and then M-O-R, so I'm totally shooting in the dark with that. But then you can see Crucible Company. And it was actually made from Battersea, England. By looking at this, I would say that not only did this company make crucibles, but they also made the ovens for assayers. This in front of me is the remnants from what used to be the sawmill. As you can see, this is a very nice wooded foresty area. So it was more economical to cut the trees down, cut them up how you need them right here on site as opposed to go to the nearest town and buy your wood. So you had conveyor belts. These would have been conveyors that came through. They sliced the wood on a saw and came off the other end. It appears this is even some wood left from the wood they didn't use when cutting it up at the sawmill. Now let's go take a look at the shaker tables. The first method to extract the gold from the rest of the rock around here used was a shaker table. This is one of the first original shaker tables here at the Columbine Complex. The way the shaker tables work is you would have had this table with little grooves in it and it would have been set on an angle. And then what they do is they shake that. And as it shakes, all the lighter rocks are going to fall down and off the table. And what you're gonna be left with is just the gold. The gold is heavier, so it, during the shaking process, doesn't move down like the rest of the rocks. Then you clean your shaker table and that's all gonna be your gold. The original way that they separated the gold from the other mineral from this mine was through the shaker table. Well, it became more economical as technology advanced back in the day to separate it using chemicals such as cyanide and arsenic. These vats are also recycled. They're from the Enterprise mine, not originally from here. And the miners used these after the shaker tables to separate the gold. It was quicker, it was easier, and it was less expensive. Hence why they put cyanide tables in here, or cyanide vats in here. One interesting thing that we always hear is, oh, mines destroy the environment, mines destroy the environment, oh, all that cyanide and arsenic, and it's destroying the environment. 
if these drained out, it would have drained and ruined everything back there if that was the case. But behind you is beautiful forest. You would never even know that this was here if you didn't see it with your own eyes. This is the boiler that they used here at the mill. Look at the fine construction of this. All these rivets put together to hold this together. And look at the sheer size of this thing. It's taller than I am. This is one massive boiler. Now, if you look at the front of this, 226. That seems like a random number to have on here, but I know for a fact this is not random. This boiler, along with a lot of the other parts used for this mill, is a recycled product. This was from one of the steam engines, actually specifically, Steam engine number 226 from the DNC RW Railway, which is basically your Denver and Colorado Railway. So, this used to be part of a steam engine. Now, it's part of a boiler at the Columbine Complex. Inside the mill is the compressor that the boiler would have ran. It would have pushed steam to this, it would have compressed, and it would have caused these gears to move these wheels, which had conveyors on them. And that's how they got things from one part of the mill to the next. I really hope you've enjoyed your tour of the Columbine Complex and the Red Buck Claim. This claim is available for purchase, and if you would like more video, more pictures, visit our website, www.goldrushexpeditions.com, or give us a call. For Gold Rush Expeditions, I'm Jessica. We'll see you at the next site.